It's double sided. It's double sided. <laughs> There's a lot of torsion about that tonight. All right, good evening, everyone. So let's let's begin. So I, I want to actually focus. Uh, there's so much to speak about in Parshas Mishpatim. There's so much to speak about in terms of the halachos. There's so much to speak about in terms of the hashkafas. But I actually want to draw your attention to probably what is going to pe- appear as a very minute detail. So we're beginning. We're going to begin with the Gemara Masechah Sanhedrin. Looking number one, Darash Bar Kafra. So Bar Kafra dash in the following idea. He says, From where do we know the concept that the rabbis espouse? Now, for lack of a better translation for right now, the way we'll explain that is, one should be deliberate in judgment. That's what misunim usually means. Masun could be deliberate, masun could be measured. So from where do we know this concept, heaven misunim badin? Be deliberate in judgment. Because the Pasik says, lo sa'ala bima'alos. Because the Pasik, now, now just to understand this juxtaposition, it says at the end of last week's parish, if we take a look at number two, literally the last, the last Pasik in parish of Yisro, lo sa'ala bima'alos al mizbichi. Do not go ahead and ascend on steps on my altar. Now, what the, what the Torah is referring to over here is that on the Mizbeach, on the altar, again, this is referring ultimately to the outer altar. Remember, the inner altar, which was the Mizbeach HaKitoras, the incense altar, was a much smaller altar. The Kohen did not, the Kohen could access it right on ground level. The outer altar, the, what we call the Mizbeach HaKitzon, which was the Mizbeach used for animal sacrifice, so that Mizbeach had a significant height. So there are two ways you can get up to the top. And remember, all the offering was done on the top of the Mizbeach. There are two ways you could get there. You could walk there on steps or you could take a ramp. The Torah instructs us to go ahead and use a ramp when going up to the Mizbeach. Asher lo sigala ervascha alav. Literally translated, so that your nakedness shall not be exposed upon it. Now, the Mepharshim all understand that this Pasuk cannot be understood literally. I Meaning, what is that saying? That the Kohen should not walk on steps, should only walk on a ramp in order that it should be Tzanuah. So the reason why, the Lord should be modest. Now the truth, the reason why it doesn't make sense is because, remember, the Kohanim, as one of their begotim, as one of their clothing, they wore under their tunic, Mechnasayim, they wore pants. So there's no, there's no inappropriate, there's, no, there's nothing immodest that could possibly happen when the Kohanim are walking up to the Mizbeach. Therefore, the commentaries understand that by definition, the Torah must be teaching us some additional lesson. There's some lesson in the ramp. And that lesson is not about, mo- well, it can be about modesty, but it's not about physical modesty. It's not about snios as we normally understand snios. So the Torah therefore says, I'm sorry, go back to the Gemara. So the Gemara says in the last week's parasha, it says, Los alos. It doesn't say that you should go up on steps. Rather, again, it says you should take a ramp. And in this week's parsha, what does the parsha begin with? 
Asher Tosim Lifneim, and that's number three. These are the laws that you shall place before them. So we have to understand this Gemara a little bit. So the Gemara now tells me that from where do we know this concept? Have a Mesunibadin, be deliberate in judgment. So the Gemara understands that it's based on the juxtaposition of the two psukim. It says in last week's parasha that one should not go ahead and take steps up to the Mizbech. Rather, one should go ahead and ascend gradually on a ramp. And juxtaposed to that is the Pasuk in this week's parasha, the Elam Mishpatim. These are the laws that you shall go ahead and place before the people. Who is the Torah talking to? These are the laws that you shall place before the people. Who is the Torah speaking to? The judges, presumably the judges, right? The judicial system, Moshe Rabbeinu, the judges. And therefore, again, the Gemara understands that based on the juxtaposition of these two verses, we emerge with a mandate for the judges to be deliberate in the way you judge. You understand what the Gemara is saying? Right? The, the drasha is that when you walk up a ramp as opposed to as opposed to steps, what's there seen a ramp and steps? Faster. Right. So fast on a ramp, okay, although, again, remember, for an older person. So why often do we install a ramp for an older person? Safer. It's gradual. It's gradual. I'm sorry? You can take the increments that you want. Correct. It's a gradual elevation. So you can go at whatever, and you can go at slower increments. The stair, meaning you can't do half a stair at once. You either do the stair, you don't do the stair. So the Gemara seems to understand that means that when you ascend, when you ascend, Go slowly, go gradually, and the fact that that pasuk is juxtaposed to the ila hamishpatim asher tassim lefneim, these are the laws that you shall place before the general populace. Teaches us, judges, when you have to adjudicate a case, don't go, don't don't address it in the step method, but rather address it in the ramp method. Don't rush to judgment quickly. Rather, be deliberate, be slow in the way you come to your conclusions. If you look at Rashi, so Rashi number four says, Masunim, Regilin Bahamtana. So Rashi understands that the word Masunim means those who are habitually slower. Regilin Bahamtana, they're regil, they're accustomed to, Hamtana, to wait. Kedei la'ayin ba yafa, kodem she tachtuchuhu. The notion of tachtuchuhu literally means what? Lachtoch, to cut. So often rendering judgment is, is, is often with cutting, right? You go ahead and you're deciding between who's right, who's wrong. Tamitar, kasher, treif, mutar, asr. So before you go ahead and you slice the judgment, before you make that decision, take your time. Take your time, analyze, think, co- right, cogitate over it. The ma'alos, number four, bechazaka b'merutza. So the idea over here is the stairs represent, again, going up somewhere in strength and going somewhere quickly. Fine. Very beautiful, important drasha with incredible importance ultimately for how we how judges address the adjudication of various cases that come up. Now remember again, the juxtaposition is not random because remember last week's parasha parasha Yisro, Yisro comes and joins Klal Yisro. What's Yisro's first contribution to the Jewish people? A judicial system. The first thing that Yisro gives us, gives Moshe Rabbeinu, is the idea, just as an aside by the way, you know that, well, all right, we'll know aside. Let's stick to the program here. So Yisro gives us a judicial system. Therefore, the Torah continues on that same stream of thought. And therefore, the Torah is now in telling us or instructing the judges as to how sh- they should decide on matters of case law. In number five, the Medrash echoes the same sentiment. Rabbi Sinu Omru, the Mesecha Sanhedrin, Minoha Milsa da Omri Rabban, and having Misun in Bedin. From where do we know this idea that the rabbis say that one should be deliberate in judgment? Because the Pasuk says, The Torah says, Do not ascend on steps to my Mizbeach. And right afterwards, the Pasuk says, These are the laws. From here we learn that a judge, What does Yisa V'yitein mean? A give and take, a back and forth back and forth that a judge should talk things out before going ahead and rendering any type of decision. Let him think about the judgment, let him decide on the judgment, then he'll share the judgment. And in fact, this concept is so important, this concept is so important that it occupies a very prominent place. What prominent place? Take a look at number six. The first Mishnah in Pirkei Avos. 
What's the first Mishnah in Perik Avos? Moshe Kivol Torah Misinai Umasur LeYoshua VeYoshua LeZekenim Zekenim LeNeviim Neviim Asur LeNeshekin Es Zagdol. So remember again, this part of the Mishnah is very important, but not so important for us tonight. This part of the Mishnah is the Masora. The concept of the Torah we have today is the same Torah that Chazal Baruch gave to Moshe Rabbeinu that's been handed down throughout generations. Heim Amru Shlosha Dram. The men of the Great Assembly Anshekin Es Zagdol said three things. What were the three things? Have a Masunim Badin, be deliberate in judgment. Ha'amidu talmidim, talmidim harbe, establish many students, va'asu siyag le Torah, and make a protective fence for the Torah. The reason why I'm quoting to you from Pirk Yavos here, not because the Pirk Yavos is contributing anything new, but you have to understand something. Pirk Yavos, if you imagine, if Pirk Yavos were to be written today, right? so how would Pirk Yavos, what would be the process of assembling Pirk Yavos? There'd be a mass email that would go out on kosher, kosher filtered internet that would go out ultimately again to all of the greatest Rabbanim of the generation that would essentially say, please send in the two or three most important ideas that you think are central for Jewish thought and central for Jewish life. So whenever something is included in Pirkei Avos, it means that it occupies a centrality in Jewish thought. Therefore, if the first thing that the Mishnah in Pirkei Avos First, Mishnah Berkevus opens up with is this concept of heavy mesunim bedin, be deliberate in judgment. What does that tell us? It's Good, thank you. Right, number one, that it's important. What else? Central. Central to who? Central to everyone. You see, Pirkei Avos is a book for the masses. Pirkei Avos is a life manual for every single man, woman, and child. The ideas espoused in Pirkei Avos are central for successful Jewish living, which means that if the Mishnah, opening Mishnah of Pirkei Avos chooses to begin with the concept of heavy misunim bedin, for our purposes right now, to be deliberate in judgment, it means that the message contained in those world, words is not simply applicable to judges. It's not simply applicable to the judicial system, but rather must have a meaning and must have a relevance for everyone. So what we're going to try to explore tonight is a two-pronged lesson. N number one, what is the deeper meaning of this lesson? What does it mean, hevel mesunim bedin? What, what is, okay, I understand, be deliberate in judgment. So number one, what is the message contained in that? And the follow-up question is, why is the Ribbono Shal Olam teaching this lesson here. So you have to understand something. This is this this more precious mishpatim occupies such an incredibly important but yet fragile fragile spot. How so? Remember what just happened for Klali Saul? What just happened? Azar Sadibra's Matan Torah. We just got the Torah. Parshas Mishpatim is where Moshe Rabbeinu fills in all blanks. Because remember again, Kabbalah's Senaitic revelation is very nice, but Senaitic revelation is comprised of the Ten Commandments. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in the Torah besides the Ten Commandments. Mishpatim is where Moshe Rabbeinu begins to fill in the blanks, the other, the other obligations, the other tenets besides the Saras Adibros. So I want to point out something very interesting to you. So can you imagine for just a moment, right after Moshe finishes with Saras Adibros, right after he finishes, with these 10 covenantal sayings, the first thing he chooses to tell Klal Yisrael is, have him as soon as Be deliberate in judgment. Now, the simple answer to why Moshe Rabbeinu goes ahead and includes this here, why the Torah includes this here is why. Simple answer. Parshas Mishpatim is all about what? Mishpat. Right, Mishpat, good. Right, true. <laughs> right, excellent. Parshas Mishpatim is what we call tort law. Parashas Mishpatim are the laws of damages, right? Every single type of damage, pretty much, is contained in Parashas Mishpatim. So therefore, again, on a very simple level, these are the kind of cases that often show up before a base, and they often show up before a Jewish court. This is, these are the type of cases that often have judicial involvement. And so Moshe Rabbeinu is kind of setting the table. As I'm going to give you all of the various tort law rules, judges, your job, your job, is to go ahead and make sure you take your time in deciding. Now, if you take that simple approach, first of all, you can go home right now, because we're done. Right? If you take the simple approach, then again, Moshe Rabbeinu is talking to a very select group of people. 
He's talking to judges. He's not talking to the general populace. He's just talking to the judges. And I also understand the placement of this between Aseras Adibros and the tort law of Parshas Mishpatim. This is all a mandate to the judges about how they're supposed to run their courtrooms, about how they're supposed to run judicial infrastructure. The problem, of course, with that approach is, as we just saw before, first of all, it's quoted again by the Medrash. Second of all, the Pirke Avos piece. The Pirke Avos piece is so compelling. You know, the Maral, I actually, I forgot to put this on the sheet. She was put on the sheet, it would have been longer than two pages. So I kept it perfectly at two pages. So the Maral says something amazing. The Maral in his parish, Derech Haim, on Pirke Avos says like this. He says that any time, in Pirke Avos, by the way, you see many, a number of Mishnayas that are seemingly speaking to judges. For example, the Mishnah in Pirke Avos says that when the Ba'alei Din are before you, you should view them both as Rishayim. View them both as wicked liars. And then when they leave your courtroom, you should view, view them both as Sadiqim. So, of course, on the most basic level, what is the Mishnah saying? First of all, it's interesting just as an aside, because generally we operate with the principle of what? Innocent, innocent until proven guilty. The Mishnah seems to say that you're guilty until proven innocent. So what's the Pshad? So the Maral explains very beautifully, Mishnah is not saying that anyone's guilty. What the Mishnah is saying is, just understand, when you're in that courtroom and two people are telling you their version of facts, they're both lying. Now, what does that mean? They're both lying. What a terrible approach to people. Understand that none of us possess objective truth, meaning we all convey subjective truth. In other words, I'm telling you the truth, but I'm telling you the truth as I understand it. I'm telling you the truth as I see it. I'm telling you the truth as absorbed through my life lens. And my life lens is a composite of my life experiences. That's why, again, when people say, you know, I'm an objective third party, no one's ever an objective anything. No one really has any level of objectivity because at the end of the day, we're all colored by a variety of different life circumstances, life influences. So the Maral says that's what it's saying, that when two people come before you, when the litigants come before you, judge, just understand, you're not going to get objective truth from either of them. You'll get from each of them, both of them, their subjective truths. So just understand that when they both stand before you, they're both, quote unquote, not totally true, not because either one maybe not because either one's trying to lie, but because everyone puts a subjective spin on their version of the truth. So the Maral says that understand this is not just important for judges, this is important in life. That whenever someone tells you something and they swear up and down that it's the truth, just understand that's what? It's not that they're lying. We don't have that type of jaded view of people, but it's their version of the truth. It's their version of the fact. It's their subjective understanding of what the reality is. And says the Marab, this is important. It's important because sometimes when people tell you something, you just have to understand and try to understand where they're coming from in order to understand what it is that they're fully saying. So why am I sharing this with you? Because the Maharal says, any time in Pirkei Avos you see something addressed to judges, we're all judges. How are we all judges? Because I judge everyone who walks into my courtroom. What's my courtroom? My Daladamas, right? If you walk into, now, now you could say, I'm not a judgmental person. Everybody's a judgmental person, right? People, we interact with people, we automatically size them up. We size them up by how they dress, by how they talk, by what they look like. And again, often this happens subconsciously. A person may try to be a very non-judgmental person. That might be true consciously. Subconsciously, we're all judgmental. Therefore, says the Ma'ra, whenever the Mishnah seeks to judges, we're all judges in our own court, court not courtroom, but courtroom, courtroom of life. And therefore, again, coming full circle, if the Mishnah, first Mishnah in Pirkei Avos, chooses to include this mandate of Hevel Mesunim Badin, be deliberate in judgment, it must mean that it's more than just simply a judicial mandate. There must be a lesson for everyone. So again, the two questions we're going to try to figure out tonight, focus on tonight, is number one, what is the deeper meaning of this, of this lesson? And number two, why is it taught here? So let's analyze a little bit. Let's take a look at number seven. Right, the Rambam. So the Rambam writes, Mesunim Badin, so the Rambam writes, what does it mean that, a, that the judge should be misunim badin? That he should delay giving a final psak, and when he reaches his conclusion, should not reach his conclusion in a hurried fashion. Rather, he should understand all of the facts. 
Shelo yiskalu betchila hamachshava. Because what happens, like, and this is so true, you know, th- this is an especially important idea in today. You know, today we live in an age of instant communication. So what's the danger of instant communication? You have a thought in your head, and then what? Boom, you communicate it. And I'm sure it's happened to all of us where I've sent whatever you're sending, a text, an email, a tweet, whatever else, and a person says afterwards, wow, I I really shouldn't have said that. I really shouldn't have said that, but what happens? What happens is if there's no time between thought and speech, that's when often we get ourselves into trouble. So the Rambam says sometimes the more you think about things, as opposed to if a person, let's say again, this is, oh, this is a very good etza, especially in moments of anger. If a person is upset about something and is responding to something or someone who has upset them, the best way is to write that email. You could save it as a draft and then revisit it the next morning. Because something amazing happens that when you give things time, when you mull things over, so sometimes, again, they have a way of, the clarity comes about with the passage of time. So therefore, says the Rambam, what the Mishnah is telling the judge, and we'll see by extension us, is that don't rush to reach conclusions. Even if you think you understand what the circumstance is, sometimes just giving things a little bit of time to sit and to settle and to stew a little bit you come to understand things differently, even just with the passage of a little bit of time, than you did initially. So according to the Ramam, again, remember, this is a message for judges, absolutely, people are adjudicating cases, and it's a message for us, for common people as well, that before I rush to judgment about someone or something, what should I do? So, so um, have him as soon and bedin, give it time. Give it time, take a deep breath, take a step back, let it swirl around your mind a little bit before you reach any kind of conclusions. Number eight, the Bartanura. Having the Sunan Bedin, the Bartanura says something different. He says, Shem ba din lefanecha pam This is very interesting. Talking to the judge. Let's say the judge has had this particular case come up before him once, twice, three times. Lo tomar din zek var ba lefanai vishanisi vishilashti. A judge should never say, ah, I've heard this case before. I've heard this kind of case before. Here's the halakha, here's the verdict, that's it. Elo, have a musun abedin. Rather, what should you do? Be deliberate, slow down. Kilomar, mamtinin kodem shetif So again, according to the, according to the Baratim Nuru, what is the Mishnah, what is the Gemara teaching me? The Mishnah the Gemara is teaching me is, no two life situations are the same. Even if the circumstances look the same, even if the circumstances look identical, or even if they look a little bit similar, take the time to analyze the nuanced differences in every single life situation. And this is an incredible idea because sometimes we model our interactions and our behaviors based on past circumstances. So I did this in this particular situation a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. Now it's the same situation. I'm going to have the same response. Sometimes that's the wrong approach. Every situation in life is different. So judge, you might think you've heard this type of case before. You may have even ruled on 10 other cases like this. It doesn't matter. Don't automatically assume you understand the facts and the realities. Even if it looks like something you've dealt with in the past, judge every life circumstance based on its own merit and take the time to evaluate. True for judges, true for us. Take a look at number nine. The Gemara here says something now a little bit a little bit of a detour. So the Gemara second beta says something amazing. But Amr Rabbi Abba, but Amr Rami Bar Abba, Rami Bar Abba said the following: Netia mekatea raglehun dekatsiva, dekatsvia or the yeah dekatsvia dekatsve. So literally translated, the sapling, the netia, that the plant, cuts off the legs of the butcher. So not, not a very positive image, but what, what does that mean? Take a look at number 10, Rashi. So Rashi says, Nitiya mekatea raglehun dikatsiva. What does that mean? That literally the plant, the sapling, has the ability to cut off the legs of the butcher. Nitiyas arla. So says Rashi, in Masechah's Beit, so the, the nitiya, the sapling that we are referring to over here, is the sapling of Arla. Remember again, what's Arla? Torah tells us that for the first three years after you plant a tree, you may not go ahead and partake of the fruit. Rather, you have to leave the fruit for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
So when person plants an Arla, uh, when a person plants a tree, the first three years of the fruit tree's life, it's Arla. Sha'amra Torah, Lahamtin Shalosh Shanim Mile'ech Operos. Remember, Torah commands me three years I can't eat the fruit. So what so what does the Allah of Arla do? Mikatea Ragli Hakatsavim Hamimarim Le'echa Kodin Hefshit Vinituach Uparamim Shinim says Trefa. So it's a very interesting Gemara. So the Gemara says that what happens, let, let's, let's take this in two different parts. So I guess sometimes there was some very eager butcher. So what would the butcher do? The butcher would shech the animal. And remember again, once you shech the animal, which is accomplished by cutting the majority of the two simanim, the esophagus and the windpipe, once you go ahead and you shech, you cut the majority of those two simanim, then technically speaking, you can rip off a piece of the flesh right then and there and eat it, leaving aside blood, because there are certain parts of the, of the animal carcass that are not as infused with blood, so I can just take off a part of the animal and I can go ahead and eat it right there. So Rashi just points out that the katsovim hamimarim lechol kodim hefshit vinituach. What's the problem with that? The problem is that if the butcher just takes off a piece of meat right then and there, before hefshit vinituach means the skinning of the animal and the cutting up of the animal, what's the danger? Upamim shenim says trefa. See, sometimes it turns out that's what? that when you open up the animal a little bit more and you inspect the animal internally, it turns out that the animal was a trefa. Now what's a trefa? I'm not getting into all the details, but a trefa is an animal that has some type of injury from which it would have died within a year. So let's say again it has a hole in its lungs or there's some other vital organ that's perforated. So it actually says something very interesting. The butcher shechts the animal, the butcher shechts the animal, and he takes a piece of meat right then and there so Rashi says, the Gemara says, the concept of Arla shows the butchers that they're doing something wrong. Because what does Arla teach us? Arla teaches us that sometimes you should wait. So too butchers, before you go ahead and you partake of the meat of the animal, you should wait. What, what should you wait for? Wait for the internal examination to make sure that the animal is totally kosher. Remember, if an animal is a trefa, let me clarify this, if the animal has some type of mortal injury, the animal is trefa. The animal is not, is not permitted for consumption. So the butcher takes the piece of meat based on the fact that he slaughtered this animal in the proper way and only finds out after the fact that indeed the animal is a trefa. Therefore, the Gemara says, we learn from our law that tells you to wait for three years that what the butcher is doing is wrong. So what's going on over here? Take a look at number 11. So Tosis says over here the following. Tosis writes, V'yesh lomar, devadai leka iser. Now the truth is, one could make the argument, we're gonna get a little bit technical for, ju for just a little while here. So Tosis says that one can make the argument, is this, let, let, let's analyze this together, is that when the shochet shechs the animal, right? Cuts the, cuts the esophagus, the animal's dead, the animal's ritually slaughtered. Is the shochet wrong? for taking a piece of flesh right then and there and eating it? No. Why? Says Tosis, Now again, without getting into all the technicalities of halacha, there's something called the chazaka. Chazaka means a legal presumption. So there is a legal presumption that animals are not trefos, right? Because the, the, the majority of animals are perfectly healthy, perfectly fine. Therefore, when the shochit goes ahead and ritually slaughters the animal, so technically speaking, there is what's called the chazaka. The chazaka is the pres legal presumption that the animal is kosher, which means that if the butcher wants to take a piece of the meat right then and there and eat it, he should be permitted to do so. Mihu, in nimtseis trefa la'achar sha'achal, hu ne'enash kishogeg velo ke'ones. Okay, now just one more piece of technicality here. So remember again, there are two, there, there are three, we'll call it three different states in the commission of a sin. A person could be a mazid. What's mazid? Intentional sinner. Intentional sinner. Shogig. Unintentional sinner. And ones. Ones means extenuating circumstances beyond my control. I could not have done anything in order to prevent this event from occurring. So it says Tosis, listen to this, it says Tosis, what Gimar is saying is like this, from Arla we learn that the butcher, that the butcher is an accidental sinner. So it says Tosis, what's the novelty in that? Because technically speaking, when the butcher goes ahead and slaughters the animal, at that moment when the animal is slaughtered, if you were to ask me, is the animal kosher or is the animal treif? What would you say? 
kosher. And not just the assumption, there's a chazaka. And chazaka is a legal reality. The chazaka is that the animal is kosher. So, Shochet says, no pro- butch is no problem, the animal's kosher, I'm going to take a little piece of meat. Then what happens? He has his piece of meat. Then, a half hour later, he opens up the animal, and he finds that there's a hole among the animal is a trefa. So what could he claim? I'm an ones. Extenuating circumstances. To which Tosa says, no, 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 no. You're not an ones. You're a shogeg. Why aren't you an ones? Why aren't you, ex- why aren't you a victim of extenuating circumstances? Because you could have waited. Right? So I'm not an intentional sinner. I'm not an intentional sinner because I was a chazaka. But I'm also not an ones. I can't call myself a victim of extenuating circumstances. Why? Because I could have remedied this whole situation, says Tosas. How? Shirohaya lo lemaher kolkach. You didn't have to rush. You didn't have to rush to eat the meat so quickly. Rather, you could have taken your time. You could have opened up the animal. You could have done the internal examination. You would have discovered that it's a trefa, and therefore you would not have eaten it. You understand? So again, right now, all the Tosas is shedding light on over here is, is the, the butcher is not an intentional sinner because he had the chazaka, the, the legal presumption to rely on. On the other hand, he can't call himself an ones. He can't call himself extenuating circumstances because he shouldn't have rushed so much to eat the meat. He's a shogeg. Okay? Very interesting. Maybe not so interesting. But listen to number 12. In his Sichos Moser. Says something absolutely amazing. So first of all, again, and just before we get to number 12, so remember, the Gemara's the Gemara springboard for this is Arla. Because just like Arla says that what? That you should wait three... Now, again, what the Gemara seems to be saying is what? Just like Arla says that you have to wait three years before eating the fruit, so to what? The butcher should wait to eat the meat until he does the internal examination of the animal. Says Rechaim Sholev, number 12, first line. This Gemara is, an, is, is, is a strange Gemara. Lama tzarech lilmod minetia shuhu nidon keover avera b'shogeg v'neanash. Harei misvara yesh lomar kein. Says Rechaim Sholev, I don't say, why, why do I need this Gemara? Right? So the Gemara is coming to teach me that if a butcher, after he butchers the animal, after he shechs the animal, eats a piece of meat, and it turns out that the animal is a trefa, that the butcher violated the laws. He, he accidentally consumed unkosher meat, non-kosher meat, by accident. I said, why, why, do I, why do I need the comparison to Arla to teach me that? That's obvious. That's obvious. He's not an intentional sinner because of Chazaka. We said that already. He's also not an extenuating circumstance sinner because he could have waited. So he's an accidental sinner. Why do I need the comparison to Arla to teach me this idea? Get ready. He says, Second line, She'eno ones, he's certainly not a victim of extenuating circumstances. Because he should have waited to see if the animal is really going to be kosher or not. Get ready for this. Really? As soon as that butcher slaughters the animal, he should be permitted to what? He should be permitted to eat the meat. Why? It's a chazaka. Remember again, chazaka says there's a legal reality. The legal reality says the animal is kosher. Then came, Therefore, really, he should be like a victim of extenuating circumstances. Because, hey, if you're the butcher, what do you say to yourself? The halacha told me I'm allowed to eat the meat. Why did the halacha tell me I'm allowed to eat the meat? Because the halacha is the one that tells me that under normal circumstances, you could rely on chazaka. Just to show you, but we rely on chazaka all the time. All the time. Person goes to the mikvah. Mikvah has to have 40 sa'ah. So let's say again, person in the morning goes to the mikvah, comes out. Now we know every single time a person goes to the mikvah, what comes out with them? Some water. There's some water, right? So how do I know? If 10 people went to the mikvah, so how do I know? It's chazaka. Chazaka is that the mikvah had 40 saw. The mikvah still has 40 saw unless I see some type of significant trap. I assume the mikvah is kosher. We rely on chazaka all of the time. And so Shabbos starts. Shabbos starts. You call. Everybody calls. 410-358, Eruv. Right, you hear again, good Shabbos, the Eruv is kosher. How do you know coming home from Shul Friday night or Shabbos morning that the Eruv is still up? How do you know that? Maybe someone came along and snipped it. Maybe someone came along and knocked it down. Maybe there was a win. What's the answer? Chazaka. 
I don't understand. So the butcher goes in and slaughters the animal. And he goes ahead and so there's a chazaka. Chazaka says, Chazaka says that animals are kosher. I have no reason to think the animal's a trefa. The animal's kosher. I'm totally justified in taking that piece of meat and eating it. And if it turns out that the animal is a trefa, I'm an ones. That's extenuating circumstances. Why is that called a shogeng? Look what he writes. Ah, minetias arla nilmad. Three lines up from the bottom, number 12. But what do we learn from arla? Chiyuv miyuchad shal hanhaga b'mesinus. So the Chalim Shalom is something amazing. Do you know what we learned from Arla? You see, up until now, we have been translating Messinos as deliberate. But there's another way to translate Messinos, and that is patience. What we learned from Arla is the concept of patience, is the concept of learning to wait before you can have something. Shechayiv Adam Linhog Bichol Maasov Api HaMessinus Right, so Chaim Shmuel Levitt so beautifully that what the Gemara is coming to teach us is that a person has to learn patience. You know the famous adage that patience is a virtue? Patience is not a virtue. Patience is an unequivocal and absolute necessity and mandate. A Jew has to have patience. You ever wonder to yourself, Ribbono Shalom, I planted that tree. And now for three years, I can't eat the fruit. You know, see, we look at that and say, what's the big deal? I've got an apple tree in my backyard. I can't eat it for three years. Who cares? I'm not really going to eat those apples anyway. Right? So you understand, in an agricultural society, you go ahead and you plant a tree. And for three years, you can't go ahead and eat the fruit. That's major stuff. So what do you want from me? Right? I'm going to make brachas. I'm going to give trumos and maestros. So why can't I eat the fruit? And what's the answer to Chaim Shulavitz? What is the Gemara teaching me? The whole mitzvah of Arla is mesinos. It's patience. It's patience that sometimes you have to learn to wait. You have to learn to be patient before you can have the things that you want. Therefore, v'chol she'eno noeg api midas hamesinos hare shelo nohog nechona. Therefore, in life, if I act impetuously, if I act quickly and I act without patience, I'm acting incorrectly. Lachin hu yatsa mechlal ones lechlal shogeg v'hari hu neenash al achilaso. Therefore, says the Chacham Shlomo, that's the meaning of the Gemara. So go back just for one moment again to number to number nine. Bar Rabba v'Amar Rami Bar Abba Nitia or Lo Mikatei Ravin the Katsavia Butcher. I understand you check the animal. You have chazaka, but why do you have to have the meat now? Why can't you wait just a little bit to go ahead and check the inside? I, lest you think, I don't have patience. People hear this all the time. I don't have patience. You don't have patience? Find some patience. Create some patience. Cultivate some patience. And lest you say that, no, that's above me, Arla. The entire mitzvah of Arla, of not eating those fruits for three years, is in order to engender and cultivate, help me cultivate within myself a sense of patient behavior, to learn that sometimes I have to pace myself, that sometimes I have to wait, and that sometimes I can't have everything I want exactly when I want it. So the butcher, if he ends up eating the meat, and the meat turned out to be treif, right, he's not an intentional sinner, that's for sure, but it's also not extenuating circumstances. It's a shogi, he's an accidental sinner, but he bears some quasi-level of fault. Why? Because he failed to exercise messinos. He failed to exercise proper Judaic patience. And according to Chaim Shmulevitz, we see something absolutely amazing emerge. What does it mean when Chazal say, Heve misunim badin? So yes, of course, to the judges it means be deliberate. But what does Heve misunim badin mean to the common man? That in life, we must learn the importance and the art of patience. We must learn that the Ribbono Shal Olam does not act on my schedule. You know, you hear this all the time. People say, I dive in for it. I dive in. I asked the Kaddish Baruch Hu for this. And he didn't give it to me. You understand that when a person says that, you understand the arrogance in that statement? God, God, I got places to be. Right? I'm saying, like, I've got appointments. I've got people to see. I've got things to do. I dive in. I really dive in. I didn't even check my cell phone once during davening. And you, 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 I, I, I need that bracha who says that God works on that timeline? And where do you come off? Where do I come off demanding something here and now? 
And the Chaim Shalom, it says that's the concept of having misunim badin. Yes, be deliberate in your judgment. Absolutely don't rush to judgment. But more than that, cultivate the art of patience. Now, why is this being taught here? This is an incredible yisod. You have to understand something, that up until this point, and the truth is, it was still going to be for the immediate future, the Rebono Shal Olam was an instant gratification God. But what do I mean by that? That we come to Yam Suf, we came to Yam Suf, and what? We needed the seat to split, so what happened? Sea split, right? We're in the desert, three and a half people need food, what happens? Mun comes down. Right? Matan Torah, remember, only 49 days. Seven weeks go by from the time we leave Egypt to sign an Edic Revelation. Halish Baruch, who's talking to us, speaking to us. Everything that happened in the process of redemption was fast, was quick, and was immediate. Everything happened in an instant. Even, yes? I, I thought uh, we made it at the absolute point. We were scared out of our minds because it wasn't opening. We were scared. It doesn't mean it didn't happen instantly. In the grand scheme of things, it happened pretty immediately. Yeah, you should have to go into the water first. I'm sorry? Yeah. So correct. So the Medrash brings out that to go into it. But again, just looking at the simple text, we're leaving aside that Medrash about people having to go in. The idea is that Hashem Baruch Hu remedied the need. Whenever there was a need, God actively remedied, remedied it immediately. And that was fine. That's the thing. In fact, again, the way we describe the, way we describe the entire experience of Geula from Israel was how? Yeshua Hashem Keheref Ayin. The blink of an eye. Everything happened quickly. Quick. It's instant gratification, God. Whatever you need, I am here. Plague after plague after plague. Everything happens in quick succession. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe that you're going to have to tell Klal Yisrael, this is not the way life is going to be in the future. This is what I needed to do for you now. Now you needed instant gratification. Now you needed everything immediately. But in the future, heaven is soon and bedin. In the future, lo sa'aleb ma'alo sal nizbichi. In the future, if you want to come close to me, in the future in our relationship, it's not going to happen with steps. It's going to happen with a ramp. Things are going to be gradual. Things are going to be slower. And the people are going to have to cultivate their incredible need for patience. And this is such an important idea, this need for patience. It's true for us all, our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we have to understand God is past, present, and future, which means that when God makes his decisions, he doesn't make his decisions in the freeze frame of now. And therefore, the devotional has to make decisions. He wears away many, many things. And I might want something now. I may need something now. And just because I don't get it now doesn't mean he doesn't love me, doesn't care about me. But again, I have to cultivate within myself the art of patience. Chalish Baruch Hu is telling us that going forward, when you want things out of life, you know, what does Chalish Baruch Hu tell Moshe Rabbeinu? God says to Moshe, Mati Tzakela, you don't even have to bother to daven. Dabra Bnei so just go in, go in, go, come on, I'm ready to help. In the future, in the future, heaven is soon and In the future, there's going to be a need for patience. That, says Reb Chaim Shmuel Levitz, is what the Torah is coming to teach us at this nexus between Parshas Yisrael and Parshas Mishpatim. As we leave Sanaitic Revelation, remember, what is Parshas Mishpatim? Parsha, you know, Sanaitic Revelation is like the loftiest experience. Where it's, almost, it's, like a, it's like a surreal, supernatural experience. And then what happens to Parshas Mishpatim? What is Parshas Mishpatim all about? You know, my ox gore someone else's ox. This ha- it takes us back into the real world. When you enter into the real world, the most important thing to enter in the re- into the real world with is patience. Person has to have patience in life. Person has to have patience with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the truth is, a person has to have patience with other people as well. I often feel this is one of the greatest challenges in our generation. Because the truth is, we live in an age of instant gratification. If, if, I, if, if I can't have it now, then there's something wrong with the service, right? If I can't have it now, then I've got to find a way to make it faster. And the truth is, again, this is true in everything. This is true in relationships, which is why sometimes people are much more reticent to put the time into cultivating relationships. And I want to, this is just as an aside, it's true, by the way, in dating and it's true in marriage, right? I often find it amazing. I've been out of the dating pressure for a while, but I often find it amazing how after one date, a person, oh, really? You spent two hours with someone? I mean, unless like they're a serial killer and you found that out. <laughs> All right, really? Two hours? That's it? You've decided absolutely no potential? No patience. 
because I think that I go out with someone and there's like supposed to be fireworks and everything is supposed to be amazing. I'm supposed to hear the birds chirping in the background and the soft music and this is my bashert and finally I feel so shalim and it's so wonderful and it's so great. Life doesn't work that way. You have to have patience. You have to put time into things. You have to allow things to germinate. You have to allow things to take root. You have to allow things to kind of sometimes self-actualize on their own. But no, we want it now. We want every, I want it now. I want it instantly. I want to fall in love. I want this. I want bliss. I want happiness. I want everything. And I want it literally in the first 15 minutes that I meet someone. And if I can't get it, sorry, not the right person for me. If you're going to take that approach in life, it's going to be really, really hard to ever find happiness because happiness requires patience. And how many times in marriages that people encounter problems and what happens? They go to a therapist, they go to someone, and they expect, it's an amazing thing, how people walk into a therapist and they think, the therapist is gonna fix everything for me. All right, I'm gonna walk in, here, I'm an hour, here's the money, and okay, just tell me what I need to do, you're gonna fix it for me. It's not the way it works. You wanna fix things in life. It requires patience, raising children. People think that as long as I put my child in the right school and this, no, it takes patience. Everything in life takes patience. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Kalal Yisrael, I just want you to know up until now, you haven't had to have any patience. You're lucky, no patience. Everything happened one after the other. Instant God gratification. Going forward, have a misun Going forward, the most important thing you're going to need to lead a successful life is going to have to learn the art of patience. Let me end with one more piece. Take a look at number 13. This is from the Sefer Medrash Shmuel. So the Medrash Shmuel is a commentary on Pirkei Avos, written by Shmuel Uzida. See, he writes the following. He says, So this is amazing. Major Shmuel says, Have a misunim badin means be deliberate, be deliberate in the way you come to your conclusions. But if the conclusion is absolutely and unequivocally clear, meaning if the correct answer is clear in front of you, then do not delay in issuing it. Therefore, says the Major Shmuel, what the Mishnah means to say is, be deliberate in your investigation of the din, in your investigation of the matter, but don't tarry with the deliverance of the correct verdict. In other words, the Major Shmuel is saying is that at the end of the day, you should be patient, you should be deliberate, you should take your time in reviewing the facts. But once you know what is right, once you know what is, what is correct, what is just, be ready to act on it. And the truth is what the Medjish Shmuel is teaching us is, again, not just simply a lesson, ultimately for judges, but an incredible lesson in life as well. When you know in life, take your time in figuring out what is MS. Take your time in figuring out what is correct. Take your time in figuring out what is true. Take your time in figuring out who you should be, what you should be, what you should stand for, what you should stand up for. But once you figure out what those things are, don't equivocate. Don't equivocate. Don't tarry in living by your ideals and your beliefs. Don't tarry in standing up for what you believe in. So take your time in deciding what is correct. But once you arrive at those conclusions, find the courage to stand up for what you believe in and do not be afraid to stand by your convictions and your beliefs. And according to the Major Shmuel, why is this here? So you have to understand something. I spoke about this in a, in, in a different shear. You know, if, if there's one thing that people want more than anything, people want more than, actually, we spoke about it last week. Do you remember again by Yisro? So remember, you remember the Shemin Hatov that we spoke out? Yes, yes, yeah, right. So the Shemin Hatov said, "Remember again, why did Yisro tarry in coming to join Klali?" So remember what the Shemin Hatov's second approach. Shemin Hatov said, "Because Yisro was afraid, what like, every Balchuva and every Ger is afraid of, which is what, Rejection. not being accepted. I don't want to be rejected. Everyone wants to fit in. So if you're fledgling Klali Yisro, you're fledgling Klali Yisro." So what happens? Fledgling nation of Israel, and the Mitzrayim are terrible to you, and the Malik was terrible to you. There's pretty much one national desire that you have, and that is 
to fit in. It would be really nice to fit in among the nations. It would be really nice not to have enemies. It would be really nice not to always bear the brunt of everyone else's anger and everything else that the nations of the world hurl at us. It would be so nice just to fit in like everyone else. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I have to tell you, have a misunim bedin. Don't strive in life to fit in. Strive in life to stand up for what you believe in. And often, when you stand up for what you believe in, it will set you apart. And it will distinguish you from all those around you. But you know what? It's okay. Because a meaningful life, a fulfilling life, is a heavy misun and bedin life. When you find MS, when you find that which is correct, when you find truth, you have to be willing to stand up for it and to stand by it no matter what occurs. I know you have a desire to fit in. I know you don't want to be oppressed. I know you don't want to be persecuted. I know you just want to be treated fairly by everyone else. But that's not our goal. Our goal has never been and will never be to fit in. Our goal has never been and will never be to be liked. Our job and our mandate and our national desire is not to be beloved by the nations of the world. If you notice, our mandate is to be an Orla Goyim, to be a light unto the nations of the world. And the way we do that is because when we find MS, when our people find, when we find truth, we hold on to it with all of our hearts, with all of our life, and we're willing to stand up for it, and we're willing to sacrifice for it, and we're willing to live our lives by it. So if we bring this all together, it turns out that what appears to be a simple lesson directed to our judges really becomes a twofold major life lesson. So remember again the juxtaposition between last week's parsha and this week's parsha. The juxtaposition between don't ascend to the altar on steps, but rather ascend to the ramp, and juxtaposed to Elam Mishpatim Shatasim with them. These are the laws that will go ahead, that I, you shall place before them, yields an interesting rabbinic dictum of having Misunim Badin. Judges, when you issue your judgment, be deliberate. Don't take the steps, but rather take the ramp. Gradual ascent. So, of course, again, the Torah is telling the judges. Be careful before you issue judgment. Be careful before you rule on something. Take the time to think about it. Take the time to sleep on it. Take the time to mull over the information because sometimes just when you process things more, they become a little bit clearer and a little bit more deliberate. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu is also conveying two majorly important life lessons to the fledgling nation of Klal Yisrael. Lesson number one that Rechaim Shulevitz taught us, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu teaching Klal Yisrael, have a misun and badin, be patient. Be patient. I've given you everything you've wanted, everything you've needed quickly, but this was an exception. This was an aberration. Going forward, you'll have to exercise patience. You'll have to exercise, exercise patience in your spirituality, in your relationship with me, in your growth, in all of your relationships. Again, patience isn't a virtue. Patience is an absolute and unequivocal necessity. Having misunim and then exercise those patience and you will find a way to get all of the brachos you want in life. And lesson number two, take your time, have a misun and bedin, take your time in arriving at your conclusions. Take your time at cultivating your tenets of MS, your tenets of truth. But once you find them, don't equivocate, don't delay, but once you find them, hold on to them, live by them, exercise them. Use those truths ultimately, again, not to fit in, but use those truths ultimately to be that Orla Goyim, to be the light unto the nations, and to illuminate the world around you. All right, we'll stop over here for tonight. The Mirat Hashem will continue next week with Parshas Kisisa.